Let's come, my friend. We are 26 hours away from the 2023 NFL Draft. This is with the first pick, the CBS Sports NFL Draft Podcast. This is episode 43 in honor of Troy Polamalu, one of my favorite players. I'm Ryan Wilson. That is Rick Spielman, our general manager, more than 30 years of NFL experience, including a decade as the Vikings general manager. Rick, doing something a little different today. We're doing a little live mailbag, answering questions in real time. You, you look a little tired. How you doing? <laughs> Good. I uh, had a couple of flights to get out to Kansas City today, but uh, everything good. It's uh, we're getting ready to, as they say, um, down the home stretch here or the last quarter turn or whatever term you want to use. So excited with all the buildup that we've had uh, for this draft. And I think it's going to be a much more exciting draft um, than it was last year because of all the quarterbacks in play. And I think, you know, we've talked about it in the past. If Kansas City does not go or uh, if Houston does not go quarterback at number two, then it's going to turn this draft upside down. Right. The hay is in the barn, I think. I think, right? The, the teams aren't doing anything. They're done, right? No. Yeah. I've, I've talked to a few people, some teams today, and they're just uh, just sitting there, sitting on ready, waiting on go. Only thing that could potentially change is a phone call about a trade, right? Yeah, but those are already happen. But a lot of times, those will not happen until you're actually on the clock. Or once Carolina, as Pete said, or I'll contradict Pete, does not take Will Levis and takes who they're supposed to take, Bryce right. Young. Yeah. Then, then the rest will be exciting after a, an exciting evening tomorrow night. And I just remember the chills. It's like hard to sleep tonight because it's your Super <laughs> Bowl. It's your game day. You know. My biggest, uh, pretty a pretty routine guy. So I'd get up in the morning. <laughs> None of the scouts or anybody would come in, you know, till afternoon on Thursday because everything is done. Decisions are made. Uh, me and my wife would uh, walk the dogs. We'd go to breakfast, and then uh, I go do uh, my uh, pregame workout and routine, and then uh, just sit there staring at the clock, waiting for it to come. <laughs> I can, after spending uh, the last three and a half months with you, I, I understand that routine. Are you able to go to bed at 9.30 the night before the draft, which is your usual bedtime? Oh, yeah. No, I go to bed at 9.30, but I'm usually up by three. Just staring oh, at the gosh. ceiling. Oh, what a, and then what I go great... sit and uh, watch Hallmark movies till about 5.36 when everybody else gets moving and, and get ready. But I, there's, there's the excitement of game day, but for front office people, there was no excitement like the night before the draft. Is there any draft that you remember in particular? Or are they all this similar routine the night before the day of? Well, when you're picking in the lower tier of the draft, it's it's a pretty long process. But if you're in that top ten, uh, it's that's you know as soon as that clock goes, and uh, Carolina is now on the clock, and then your juices are flowing. And the the exciting part about it is you don't have any control. All you're sitting there is waiting. And you're a control to freak. React. Yes. And <laughs> it's just like in a game. All right. We've prepared. We've done everything we could. We've been through hundred different scenarios. And now let's just see what happens. And when it happens, uh, usually you're prepared and ready to, to rock. But the excitement of having a player that you covet come to you, the excitement of moving up and down, those are the things that you can't replicate. And I can't explain that feeling on uh, how exciting that is. For example, uh, like someone like, say, Justin Jefferson comes to you and the pick before, the team before, takes a wide receiver not named Justin Jefferson. Yeah, but, you know, that realistically, that is all kind of luck. Some, some years you're sitting there and the board just falls to you. And then other years it doesn't seem like it's, falling to you the right way so yeah then you try to make some adjustments but a lot of it is you know the preparation part but it's like when you're in a in a game you just have to react and sometimes you're in a groove and it's just flowing and other times you're not and then you have to figure out how to how to adjust and uh keep going because there are times when you're that sitting there not the first round but sometimes even friday and saturday those are exciting. Those are the most exciting days. And as I told you last year, the first time I worked with you on set, you wore a tie on Saturday, which was totally embarrassing because we will not do that this Saturday. <laughs> it's a working man's day. Right. That's the scouts day. Those are the guys that 
really uh, had a lot of say uh, on that uh, Saturday uh, draft. So what year was your first draft involved in the NFL? Do you remember what year that was? 1990. So in those 30 plus years, 33 years, how much has the draft changed from 1990 to your last draft in 2021? Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> Technology wise is, you know, in 1990, my first draft, I was the guy that took the magnetic cards off the board and then put them under uh, the player under the team that was drafted. So I was up and down. I got a lot of steps in that day uh, trying to find guys on the board. And it's funny, the top of the board, it's easy to find guys. But all of a sudden on Saturday, you're looking at guys that you only have 150, 160 guys on your draft board. Then you have this whole backboard with probably 700 guys on it. And then mm -hmm. uh, you are trying to find names that maybe you didn't like, but someone found someone, player number 654. So you're going up and down all the positions trying to find the name. That was pre-computer days. So it was all. And the draft done. was just over the weekend. Is that right? If I, I, you know, to be honest with you, it wasn't like it was now in prime time and all that stuff. I think we did it over a two-day period, Saturday I think that's Sunday, right. if I'm not mistaken. So those were very right. long days to get through uh, get through those <laughs> yeah. rounds. All days. right, before we, uh, before we turn to the questions, and Debo is going to be our, our moderator here, just to point out, Rick, our final mock draft is in the feed. You can check that out. Me, you, and Josh Edwards did one last mock draft for old timey's sake. I'm sure they will probably all be wrong by the time the draft rolls around. Uh, yesterday was, I don't even know. We talked about our favorite, pro, uh, prospects, both, uh, sort of well-known guys and then some sleepers and you can check that out in the feed and coming up, we are just getting warmed up Thursday through Saturday recaps live on YouTube Friday and Saturday. We'll be simulcasting with CBS sports and Rick, you will be here. Am I correct in saying Friday and Saturday? That's correct, right? I will be, yes. I've got a uh, actually a early afternoon flight from Kansas City to get to LaGuardia, and I will make it. The dollar bet is that I can get from LaGuardia to the studios in Stamford, Connecticut in an hour. Not a great way to start off the draft weekend by losing a dollar <laughs> bet, but hey, your money, <laughs> not mine. And oh, finally. You can hear, uh, you can head over to the NFL on CBS YouTube channel at any time to see our ever growing list of individual seven round mock drafts. Those are uh, that hay is in the barn as well, but that's a little fun little exercise we did. And um, it was fun. All right, Debo. Oh, Debo flashes the dollar bets here. If you're watching on YouTube, will the, let, let's go through it real, real quick because people have asked about this and we'll revisit it after the draft. But as long as we're here, and we'll, this will be the first question. Um, I'll read through a couple of these, and the question will be, Rick, how confident are you in these bets? So the first one's over under 60 minutes for Rick to get from LaGuardia's to Stanford <laughs> at a, around 5 p.m., if I recall correctly, correct? Yes, I land at uh, actually 5.55 New York time, 4.55 Kansas City time, so I'm losing an hour going back. I will even give you an extra seven minutes if you want to take it, unless you feel that confident. I feel very confident, and I've never done that drive before. No In fact, point. Debo hasn't even – no one has sent me the address to the studio I'm supposed to go to, so I'm assuming that someone will do that here between now and I will, uh, my game when I land. Give me a dollar, and I'll tell you where the address is. <laughs> I'll have plenty of them, so I'll give you one. I'll spot you one. Yeah. <laughs> will the Giants take a wide receiver in round one? Rick says no. I say yes. You still feel okay about that? Yes. No, I'm saying I'm going to stick with no. And, oh, boy, you, this is $2 you're going to lose in a hurry here. Will the Packers take a wide receiver in round one? Rick says yes. You probably don't yes. feel great about that. That was one of our first dollar bets, like early February. But let me ask you this, Debo. Now, <laughs> since there's been a trade, can we maybe revisit that? Oh, that what's, God, the rule on, what's the rule on a February bet? that there was a trade that took place that move them up two spots. I'm sorry. Debo, $1 you're... bets are all final. Uh, <laughs> I, I should have anticipated the Rodgers trade. That was my fault. <laughs> uh, here's a good one. Over under 30 and a half Brian Brzee draft spot. Rick, you're going under. I went over. I, I think you're, you're, do you feel so pretty good about that? I think you're going to win that. Yeah, I'm going to win that. I'm going to win the over under two and a half tight end oh, selected gosh. in the first round. That's, a, I, that's I just... an automatic win for me. I blew the dollar on will Bijan be selected in round one. You talked me into saying no. You must have made me do that. 
Yeah. There's oh a, no. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna lose this one too. Over under 19 and a half Christian Gonzalez draft spot. You have under. Jeez. Yep. All right. I need these other two to come in. Will Julius Brents be selected in round one? Absolutely yes, not. I said. <laughs> and Jack Campbell, same question. I said yes. Absolutely not. You're going to I hope you uh got your paycheck and your wife's going to understand that there'll be a few less dollars uh coming out of your paycheck this month. Honey, we're trying to rub two nickels together and Rick stole both nickels. That's that's all <laughs> I'm going to tell her. All right, Debo, you got a question for us? Stu Brumhill, who's a uh, avid supporter of the podcast. So that is great. He asked Rick, should I worry that Pete Carroll's age will impact on the likelihood of the Seahawks taking a project project quarterback with the first pick? Hopefully uh, we won't be picking this high again for a while. The only reason you're picking this high is because this is the Russ Wilson uh, pick great. from the Denver Broncos. So you'll pick again at the bottom of the first half. 20, I believe. 5 and 20 is when the Seahawks pick. Here, you know Pete Carroll certainly better than I do, and you know John Snyder, the GM. It feels like Pete Carroll, who might be 70 or close to it, he looks and acts like he's 50. So is it, could he coach another five years? Oh, yeah. No, I think Pete still has the energy. As long as he has the energy and just seeing him making all these trips to these pro days where we saw these guys at, they, uh, they were a lot of the uh, quarterback pro days that uh -huh. we were at. Uh, so... I still don't think they're going to go. I don't think that'll influence them, but I think because of where their football team is right now and what they were able to accomplish last year when no one gave them a chance uh, to add a couple pieces to that defensive side, they may be more focused, in my opinion, on we have a chance to go out and win the NFC West this year. I mean, you have Arizona, you know, San Francisco is going through a little bit of, of change. Um, and then you have the Rams who are in a total rebuild. So when you look at the NFC West and look at that division, I think Seattle thinks, and I, and I believe it as well, they have a legitimate chance to win that division. So they may start focusing their draft on a couple of these, you know, primetime defensive players, um, just because of where they're at as a football club and a lot farther along than I think people thought they would be. Yeah, and a couple things. Debo points out that um, P. Carroll will be 72 by week two of this upcoming season, so he's the youngest 72-year-old you'll see, number one. And number two, maybe they were right about Russ Wilson because a lot of people were wondering what was wrong with P. Carroll and John Schneider when they moved on from Russ Wilson. It turns out Geno Smith had a better season. There's no disputing that, but maybe they, they thought they could do more with, with less, so to speak, in terms of contract for quarterback. All right, Debo, what's next? Andrew Collins asks on the old YouTube machine, driving down to Kansas City for the draft tomorrow morning. Should have given Rick a ride. My question for Rick, out of these top wide receivers, who do you think would compliment JJ the best? I'm assuming that's Justin Jefferson. Yeah, I don't think he'll be there when Minnesota picks. But, uh, you know, to me, Smith and Jigba, uh, would be definitely a compliment to that offense and another playmaker for them. They may look at a Zay Flowers, uh, who plays bigger than his size. Uh, the only other guy, because uh, to get another big guy on the outside that can run, Quentin Johnson. But I don't know if they'll lean towards receiver. I think it'll depend on how the corner board comes off because they definitely need some depth at the corner position. So, but any of those three would be a big time compliment to Jay. They have to get someone to take the heat uh, off of JJ because everybody's double covering him now with Thielen gone. You know, KJ Osborne's been a solid number three, but I don't know if he's a number two. So I think to get a number two in this draft and if they go corner, they're definitely going to try to address the receiver position on Friday. What about Jordan Addison? Is that too early for him? Because I like him a lot. Yeah, Jordan Addison can come in. I mean, I'm glad uh, not, not to bring Pete into this conversation, but uh, he used my comparison I made back in the fall of Devontae Smith. And uh, I think he'd be another another uh, really good addition to, to Minnesota's offense. All right. You oh, know what it'll be? It'll be interesting to see how much influence Brian Flores has as a new defensive coordinator, oh, too. That's right. I forgot that he, their he offense was good. 
their defense did not play well last year. So, so in order for them, you know, to advance, uh, they have to get help on the defensive side of the ball. So it would be interesting to see how big of impact uh, with Coach Flores coming in there. Yeah, and it they drafted – Andrew Booth Jr. and Lewis Seen last year, neither of whom played a whole bunch because of injuries. So in a sense, those are day one, day two picks coming back. But as you always say, you can never have enough cornerbacks. Al Bundy from YouTube asks, can a small arm, shorter player like Kalijah Cansey play a defensive end position in a 4-3 defense? Would some teams who may potentially uh, be drafting him consider him in that role or is the length too short for a defensive end? And just to recap, he's 6'1", 285-ish. And he ran really well, but the arms are sub 31 inches, Rick. Yeah, usually the shorter guys have a lot tougher time matching up versus the offensive tackles in this league. So I don't think he would be as effective if someone moved him out to a defensive end. He's definitely a three tech, but he has to go to a scheme fit. So if you're what going does three to tech mean? A three tech is an under tackle. So you have the nose tackle, then you have the uh, three technique or the under tackle. Uh, which is supposed to be the disruptive force. And I think he has the ability to do that if he fits the right scheme. Now, if you're going to play a even or an odd front, a three, four scheme and put him as a five technique, he's going to struggle. Or if you're that going means to he's have, over the that means he's over the tackle. Yes. Over the tackle and sometimes, you know, depending on on, on where he ends up between the guard and tackle. The problem is if he, you're going to have him try to sit there and hold the point versus combination blocks versus double mm. teams, he's not going to do that. And some schemes have their defensive linemen hold and anchor the point first so the linebackers can flow three to, free to the ball. Him, and he has to be in a one-gap scheme or an upfield scheme so where he can utilize his speed, his quickness to get up the field and he doesn't have to worry about trying to anchor and hold the point. So scheme fit will determine how uh, much success that Cansey will have. The other thing is Cansey, if you look at him, if you want to call him a blue pass rusher, or that's his strength. And if you have a guy that is an inside pass rusher that has pro bowl or blue or very good starter uh, ability, and you move him to a different position, then he's not going to play the same so my philosophy has always been if you have a blue player or if you have a player that's high on your draft board play him at the position that he's at that he's that, that that's where his talent is but if you move him outside which he hasn't done and he's going to struggle versus the length of the offensive tackles and there's a lot more space than where his quickness may be neutralized rather than when he's inside over a guard that's not going to make him as effective as an inside player. Right. And that's typically the conversation we have about offensive tackles moving inside because of short arms. Rarely do we have that conversation about interior. Different, defensive though. Yeah. Right. Right. Different because Skaronsky is a different cat. Nope. That's but right. If you take Skaronsky, for example, he's always played on the left side. That's not as easy as people think. Well, let's just move him over to right tackle. Right. Okay. So now he's a, Solid starter, potential pro bowler at left tackle, or for definitely if he moves inside a guard. But if you move him to right tackle, then he's probably not going to be as effective because he's never done that before. And that'll take time. One other thing, and then we're going to take a quick break. Is Kalaja Kansi a first rounder on your board? If it's the right scheme. Yeah. You know, uh, let's say, you know, I brought it up in, I don't know, one of the 2000 and. <laughs> 555 <laughs> mock drafts that we've done that I've corrected everybody on you and, and Pete and uh, Josh. And by the uh, way, thank you Emory. for that. I haven't, I haven't told you that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're much better this year. <laughs> are you going to make, go ahead. What are you going to do uh, with the jets? I was going to think, yeah, potentially with the jets, you may imagine him with Quinn and Williams uh, and those two inside, but Again, a small guy is not going to line up 17 games, six snaps a game. You have to have a rotation. You have to have a rotation on a defensive line, especially. What made Philly so good last year up front is they had depth and they rotated those guys in. And if you look at any team that's been in the Super Bowl or won a Super Bowl, 
they have great defensive line depth and they're able to rotate guys in and out to keep them fresh throughout the game. Uh, one last question in terms of, uh, and Pete talked about this on the mock draft show that we did on Tuesday night for CBS Sports HQ. The Chargers need defensive line help. Does Cansey fill what they need there? Or is that not the right scheme fit? Well, the, and Pete brought up a great point is that they've struggled to stop the run. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to draft Cansey, he's not going to be a great run stopper. Right. So, you know, he went with Mozzie Smith from Michigan who is a better run stopper, doesn't have the same pass rush ability. I totally disagree. I still think you go on the offensive side of the ball and get uh, Herbert some more weapons on the offensive side of the ball. Okay, let's take a quick break. Come back and answer some more of your questions right after this. Come and get it. So much new beaters. So when are you going to put those needles in? <laughs> Ow, my back. So much new butthead. Yeah, baby. Parenthood is cool. I now pronounce you husband and husband. This is the happiest day of my life. So many all new reasons. Hail Dimpin' and Earthling. (laughs) To stay on the couch. Let the games begin. An all new season of Beavis and Butthead now streaming exclusively on Paramount Plus. Use promo code Nachos for one month free. If you're uh, listening on the old podcast machine, you didn't see the commercial there, but uh, I think it is fitting, Rick, that Beavis and Butthead was the commercial break uh, for us, too. That, that, that seems about, I just yeah. would like Debo to get me Paramount Plus. It's outstanding, but I can't. I, I would love to have that since I do some podcasts here. Maybe I can get that thrown in. Oh, I love it, by the way. It's great. So hopefully we could we could make that work for you. Hopefully well, if you ever Rick, invite me to your Rick house, up $9 I... after $1 bets so he can <laughs> he can purchase a month. Yeah, yeah. I could get one month. Don't I get one month free if I or, yeah. or no? Yeah, you do. If you subscribe to the podcast, you get a free month. So look at look into that. <laughs> we'll get you hooked up, Rick. I promise. All right, here's the next question from YouTube. Cloudy Future asks, how do they see the quarterbacks going order-wise? Can you match those quarterbacks to teams? Kind of surprised Levis rumors at two. Hey. So I think we both agree at one, the Panthers. Yep. At two, Rick, it sounds like the Texans might be off the quarterback unless it's a, a wonderful smoke screen. I would take CJ. I think you would take CJ Stroud there too. Correct. But do you think he goes there? Let me ask you that. I don't know. The more uh, the smoke is thickening in the air, <laughs> the closer we get to Thursday night, the more you're hearing that they're going to go defense. And and I can understand that. I mean, logically, you got a new head coach that's a, you know, not only a, a great leader, but a great defensive mind. And they have to get better on defense. But you ask yourself too, is like, do they really go with their quarterback room from last year? Uh, I understand they signed Case Keenum as a backup. Um, I believe, was it Case that they signed, Ryan? Uh, I think so. Debo can double check. I don't have that in front of me because I'm I'm in the mobile podcast machine. Yeah, I'm in a hotel room. But But I believe, I was going to say, it's going to be, go ahead. I was just going to say, let's assume that they don't take a quarterback there. And then you're sitting there at four as the Colts and you have your choice between everyone not named Bryce. I'm taking CJ. Who are you taking? CJ. And yep. Yeah, Case Keenum, you get that one right. Yep. Uh, and then afterwards, it's a crapshoot which one falls. But if Houston does not take a quarterback at two, they could have Richardson or Levis right there at 12, unless someone moves up to try to get one of those guys. Because okay, I we don't talked about Detroit this. We'll take a quarterback. Oh, you might know and about that. I don't, yeah, I don't know about that. I, uh, I, You're guessing. I am not, I'm guessing because I have not talked to my brother. I do not want to uh, cross that line. <laughs> so I'm guessing as much as you guys are. And, and I don't think clear, Vegas will. And to be clear, Rick, you are, you are guessing because you – you are as tight lipped as a, I don't know, something, somebody with their mouth sewn shut, literally. You, you won't tell us anything. So that's incredibly, you know, by the way, I was talking to Pete today when, when I was driving over here to, to Stanford. And Pete's like, uh, why doesn't Rick tell us more about what's going on with the Lions? I said, I don't know. You have to ask him. He, goes, he should be telling us stuff. We're telling him all this stuff. He's not telling us anything. <laughs> um, okay. So, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago on the clusters pod. I think it was actually just last Monday, which is 
Sounds funny. And by the clusters pod, if you didn't see it, that's when you have your draft board set and you have your players rank within positions and also where they might fall in the draft board. So if you're the Texans and you weren't crazy about Anthony Richardson or Will Levis, or at least they were below some non quarterbacks on your board, when you get to 12, you're not taking either one of those guys, right? You're not changing in the middle of the process. No. Is that correct? No. But at 12, that, that becomes a different. Uh, sure, they went through that scenario. If we okay. go defense and one of these two, Levis or Richardson, falls to 12, which one are we taking? Because we can take one there. Or do we get aggressive? And if we see one of those two are starting to fall, do we potentially move back up to go get that quarterback? Two questions. Which quarterback is drafted last among Richardson and Levis? And is it in the first round? And number two, does Hendon Hooker get drafted before one of those quarterbacks? Um, I heard a lot of a lot of buzz about Hendon Hooker as of late. And mm-hmm. you know, everybody is has these four quarterbacks and and understand everything we've discussed on Hendon Hooker, the age, the ACL. I saw a report today, I think it was in the media, that he'll be ready by the first game. Yeah, um, we'll but see. he's going to be redshirted um, and let him learn behind someone. But if these teams think that Hendon Hooker, because if he wouldn't have gotten hurt, he would have been definitely in the mix on who is three, four, and five. Because I think he's, and teams are going to have their draft board set differently. So don't be shocked if Hendon Hooker goes before uh, uh, or Richardson. That'll be fun. Do you want to take a, bet, a dollar bet on that one? Yeah, which one do you, which one do you want? I'll give you the option because you're down so many dollars right now. All right, Hinton Hooker just has to be drafted before he he can't be quarterback five. Just anything other than quarterback five, right? Other anything other than quarterback five. All right, I will take the that he is in fact drafted before quarterback five. I will sacrifice a dollar, but I'm kind of leaning with you. But just since you're <laughs> down so much, I'll go. Okay, he'll be five, not four. Thank you. It'll help pay help pay my toll when I have to drive back home. <laughs> All right, that was a great question. Now let's go to at dudes ruthless asks. Love the show. Thank you. I appreciate that. And as says Rick, looking forward for the guy at Byron merch to drop. That's funny. Uh, who could be this year's Brock Purdy? Is it Jake Hayner, Stetson Bennett, Tyson Bagent, or another? And we saw two of the two of two of those players at the senior bowl. Uh, Stetson Bennett was uh occupied in Austin, Texas at that time, so he wasn't there. Um, you and I both have heard that he didn't interview particularly well at the combine came off sort of abrasive. Uh, that takes nothing away from what he did at his time at Georgia. And I'll start with Stetson. Cause I want to ask you this, Rick, do you care that maybe he's sort of arrogant? I mean, you want, you want your quarterback to have an edge and you want your quarterback not to have everything given to him. Uh, is there a line with, with which is too much? There's a line of being confident, but not cocky because yeah. cocky can be rub people the wrong way. But if you come across confident, um, I don't know. We've never sat down with, with the player or talked to the player. So I couldn't tell you the personality. You know, you hear everything out there on him, uh, but he can rub people. That's one of the positions where you definitely want to make sure that that quarterback um, is the type of personality, the type of leader that the players want to play for. And if they rub the players the wrong way, then why would they follow him? So, and I don't know that you can't discredit what he was able to accomplish at Georgia. Right. That's, that's a given, but my, I guess Brock Purdy of this year's draft. I know you don't agree with me would be uh, the Fresno state flash. I just think he has something to him. Yeah. Uh, like we talked about Hayner, like we talked about. Yep. Yeah, I think last night, uh, or the other day was that he just he may not be the athlete, but he just has some kind of it factor or savvy on how to play the position. Yeah. And you know what? Actually, I don't necessarily disagree with that. I like uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson a little better just because of the athleticism, but he doesn't strike me as a Brock Purdy type who can come into year one and win a bunch of football games. Maybe it's the case if you go to the 49ers and college and hands down up plays that helps. Yeah, but, that, that helps a lot if you go to the right place and you're playing for a Kyle Shanahan in this league. 
Because I don't maybe, know, if Brock. Would you think Brock Purdy would have been Brock Purdy if he wasn't in San Francisco? No, I always say I say this about Patrick Mahomes. If Patrick Mahomes had gotten drafted by the Browns, he'd be out of the league by now. That Browns, <laughs> the way that team was at the time. Um, but I, I do. Th- I mean, Brock Purdy deserves some credit because Trey Lance. Oh yeah, he, he got hurt, of course, but it, he didn't look like Brock Purdy early on. And also, I think it just reinforces the fact that it's so hard to figure out who these quarterbacks are. Uh, another name I want to mention because. I, I think Hayner's one. Clayton Toon, again, right situation, might be able to to have some success early on. Um, he can spin it too. But again, yeah. none of these guys had good senior bowls. Tyson, Tyson Bajant seemed a little bit overwhelmed, a Division II player of Shepard, uh, when he was at the senior bowl. He'll, we'll see if he gets drafted. It'll be close, I think. But I don't think he's going to come in as a Division II player. That would be something special. I mean, can you think of someone, a small school guy, who came in in year one and had had was forced to the field? No, had any, that's, 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 that's a tough That's a tough task uh, yeah you know but the guy that i'm surprised that you've kind of came off on that you were crowing about oh yeah all fall was your byu flash man he i've heard that teams like him more than the media but the last thing that i have in my memory for jaron hall is that senior bowl and I don't know if he was injured. I don't know if something was going on because everyone there did not look great at the quarterback position. But what I saw there in Mobile did not match what I saw on tape at times. Like I've heard late day two, that seems incredibly rich. And that might just be, you know, chit chat, smoke screen stuff. But um, I think he gets drafted. And I thought you were going to mention Aiden O'Connell as well, who I also like, but the lack of athleticism is troubling if he's not well protected. So. I don't know who the Brock Purdy is going to be. The other thing about Brock Purdy, he was athletic. And the year before he came out, he had a really good season, and he just tried to do too much in that final year at Iowa State, and that sort of hurt his draft stock. By the way, Rick, I'd forgotten about this. In one of my like day after mock drafts, after the 2020 season or whatever, the 2021 mock draft had Brock Purdy going in the first round. Oh, well, that's that's incredible foresight on your side. <laughs> That's the last time I had him in the first round, but that's another. That, don't worry about that part. Okay, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that was pre-draft. Did you have what about, about right before the draft? Oh yeah, I wasn't even talking about him. <laughs> okay, <laughs> he had a terrible season. That's why. So you okay. know, you live and you learn. All right, here we go from Matt Weber. He asks, with a team like the Texans, new coach but not a new general manager, does pick number two go more towards a building block piece like Will Anderson? or the potential of an Anthony Richardson. We've talked partly about this, but we haven't mentioned AR-15 as a, as a possible number pick number two guy. What about pick number 12 if you don't think number two for AR? Yeah, and uh, but that's where our bet's going to come down. Let's say Anthony Richardson there, Will Levis. I still think that, you know, it, it's the system, you know, and I uh, – who – uh, Debo, maybe you can pull it up because I can't recall right now. I don't know who they brought in as their offensive coordinator, but if they're going to run a system very similar to what San Francisco did, okay, Anthony Richardson fits more like Trey Lance. Right. Okay, Purdy may be more like, and I'm not discrediting Will Levis's athletic ability because I think he's extremely athletic, but a Hendon Hooker or Will Levis may be more Brock purdy each or Jimmy Garoppolo-ish, if that makes sense. How about uh, Jimmy uh, Bobby Sloak is the new offensive coordinator, by the okay. way. Thank you, Debo. I think Hendon Hooker, in terms of pattern, having a San Francisco-like offense, Hendon Hooker might be the best option for that quarterback position. Because he's probably the most accurate of them and the best decision maker of them. And in San Francisco, you have to be able to process quickly and you have to be a very accurate passer. And I think Hooker, even though everybody is maybe looking at it negative of the system he came out of at Tennessee, but I think Hooker would fit that system the best out of those three. And by the way, he's actually a really good athlete. He can win with his legs if that's what you want, and that's part of the reason Trey Lance was drafted. That's an interesting angle to keep an eye on because of those three players, and assuming they're all 100% healthy, I might take Hendon Hooker at 12 over Levis or Richardson. Yeah. And that's, and that, again, it's going to depend on the system and the decision on a quarterback's weigh very 
heavily on who the offense, especially the offensive coordinator is, and if the head coach is a offensive minded coach or came from the offensive side of the ball. So I know when you're sitting there and, you know, you saw that um, Scott Fritter and, and Frank Reich had a, you know, their come to Jesus meeting on who they're going to take at number one. But I'm sure Frank Reich had a lot of say. Jim Caldwell mm -hmm. had a lot of say of uh, who that quarterback's going to be. Uh, update Debo informs me that my seven round mock draft just before Brock Purdy's draft last year. He wasn't in any of the 256 picks. So I went from first rounder to <laughs> not even draft. <laughs> Glad you like that. Yeah. Shocking. <laughs> Thanks for the update. Debo. All right. Next question. Moving on. No need to laugh and linger from Kyle Enstrom. Rick, I'm a Vikings fan and want to thank you for your service and dedication to our fan base. Oh, Rick definitely wrote this one. My question is who was the one player during your time that you were so close to drafting and ultimately weren't able to? Did you try to trade up? Maybe you can tell us who it is. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a lot of years and a lot of names and a lot of picks. Um, the one player that we tried to move up, I remember, and uh, try to make a trade and weren't able to do it was uh, uh, Gardner Johnson. Uh, when he oh, really? Blazer. Chauncey? Yeah, Chauncey was. We liked him. We were trying to move up in the draft. We thought we had a deal done. And then with about two minutes left to go in the draft, we ended up uh, not being able to – well, we got hoodwinked. I won't see the, taint, the team who hoodwinked us. Mm. Uh, but uh, we were left standing at the altar. And that was the first time I ever got mad in a draft, very mad. I was gonna say you and actually fired threw up. my squeeze ball at the uh, board. But luckily it's soft, so it didn't break all the TVs. <laughs> oh, man. How about that? So he fourth rounder, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, we thought it was great value, the fourth round, you know. And uh, one of the – we always were very uh, proactive in the fourth round because – when you look at Saturday and you can have one of those top two or three picks, that's the best of the rest. And a lot of those guys probably are as talented as they should have gone on Friday. Right. You know, and, you know, a couple of guys we moved up on uh, to go get uh, was Brian Robinson, uh, B-Rob, out of <clears throat> Texas that year. We went up and got him. We were very excited to go get him. And then we, sat and we thought we got great value for Everson in the fourth round too, Griffin, mm -hmm. um, who fell not because of ability, but some other, but he ended up being a great player for us. All right. Debo is doing the math here at pick one Oh two in that draft that we're talking about here. You guys took um, Madison, the running back. Yes. So you must've had conversations about Chauncey Gardner Johnson, or was it the yeah. case that oh, okay, yeah, we had, it, it, that's a situation where we like both players a lot. And mm -hmm. we needed some defensive help, but we also knew we had Delvin Cook, uh, but we wanted to make sure that we had another running back because our emphasis was to run the ball at the time. So uh, Madison was, uh, you know, fit what we wanted. I have to give a lot of credit to our scouts and to uh, Kennedy Palamula, who was our, our running backs coach, who's out in Vegas right now who was, had an excellent eye for talent. and he Troy's uncle, I think, right? Yep. Uh, he was really pounding the table on the uh, for Alexander Madison. And so we were happy that we got Madison, uh, but we went after Gardner first. Uh, but, you know, Madison wasn't a consolation prize because we would have been happy with either one of them. We just needed a – we wanted to go defense. And when we lost out on that, we were over – Overly excited uh, to get uh, Madison. No, Madison's been a great player for sure. All right, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll answer some more questions. Ghostface is here. He's going to keep coming for us. Did you miss me? We've got to lure him in. And then we execute him. Now streaming on Paramount Plus. Rick, when you get I, Paramount Plus, you can I, watch I, I can get that Paramount Plus. <laughs> I don't know.
Oh, is it is it like you had to be five years with CBS where you can get a Paramount Plus pass, or how does that work? I don't know. I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Uh, <laughs> Rick Debo gets you taken care of. He he loves. <laughs> I know he said that uh, back in uh, on our first <laughs> podcast when I saw the uh, commercials on uh, our podcast for Paramount Plus, and then our, we were at the what? Super Bowl, and we did the Wheel of Fortune or the spin thing with the yeah, uh, the fans. The uh, yeah, with the fans, and I still was spinning. I still couldn't get a Paramount Plus card. <laughs> you got a free Paramount Plus koozie though, so it's the same difference. No, I I, I took the chat. <laughs> he took the chapstick. <laughs> All right, we're gonna the do a little uh, little rapid fire ish version uh, of some of these questions, so we can get s- through some of these. All right, Debo, what we got? Dabney Offerman asks question for Rick: How much weight do you think Chris Ballard puts on the S two test? And did Rick put a lot of weight in the Wonderlick back in his day? And let me just clarify: Rick, did is the S two? Did you guys have access to that too, or was it a different test? No, we, we use a different test. I'm okay. not familiar, but just a, so I can clarify some things on these psychological tests or these S2 tests, or we use HRT, uh, Human uh, Tactic Resources, which was a great test for us, is that you get an overall score on these psychological tests and these cognitive tests and intelligence tests, but there are specific categories in there so, for example, um, we would weight what part of the test was most important for the position. So his overall test score could be low, but what was weighted in there, he scored very highly on. So we discarded the overall test and looked at the categories that were most important and the reason how we knew they were most important because our analytics department back tested all of the results over the last 10, 15 years. And they came up with a profile for each uh, position. So for example, and I've talked to this one thing that I never knew, but most receivers that ended up being in Pro Bowl, there were three specific areas. The one area that I didn't know about was social maturity helped predict uh, what type of uh, receiver he was going to be in the NFL. And you wouldn't think that at that position. Do you have any insight uh, about what Chris Ballard's thinking with these tests? Or that would just be speculated? I know Chris. I, I, I think Chris is an excellent personnel guy. He came up the same way. Um, I'm sure that these tests will have some influence. But what these tests do is a raise questions that you want to uh, get answered. So, for example, if he had the results of the C2 test or S2 test, and there were specific areas in that test that red flagged, then I would definitely, when I went and had a personal workout or private meeting with the quarterbacks, that we would want to get that answered. So when we came back, yeah, he scored low here, but we explored that, we we vetted it out and we feel that we're still comfortable even though the test said this so it's a tool it's not a decision maker right and that's an important point great question dabney all right Debo, what else we got mario giovanni asks curious rick if you think the nfl would ever add a day four oh sweet lord please don't let it happen they could dominate the weekend and have two rounds each day rather than having one on thursday uh two on friday and a f- and four on saturday what do you think of that four days well that would be great for the fans, but I think uh, everybody else that are definitely involved. Sunday, you couldn't wait till F Saturday because Saturday night after the draft, it's the what I call the uh, organized chaos because of mm. everybody trying to sign 20, 30 guys to their roster within three hours that did not get drafted. And then uh, at the end of Saturday, you are just mentally drained. You're done. And Sunday, it was like a cleanup day. I'd have all the scouts come in. We had a couple meetings, but everybody was just fried. And it was time to take a break. So another day added may be great for TV, but I don't know if you pulled all 32 general managers that they would be in favor of that. Yeah, TV maybe. I think, uh, Ryan, you would be excellent if we even extended for a whole week. Let's say we started on Monday and went through to Friday. Why don't we do 24 hours for the entire week? Not, 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 not,
All right, Mario, hope that answers your question. What's next, Debo? Al Bundy asks, Rick, everyone keeps saying Matthew Bergeron is a guard. He is the uh, offensive tackle out of Syracuse. Yeah. He's, not sh- uh, he's not short on height or, or short arms or lightest weight um, in terms of to, to play tackle. Can Bergeron realistically play offensive tackle um, maybe on the right side? I think he can play tackle, but I think Peter Skaronsky can play tackle. Um, what do you think about Matthew Bergeron? Yeah, and I know you liked him a lot, I know, in the fall when we talked about him. I don't know if he has left tackle feet. Mm -hmm. Uh, He plays a little high, but a lot of times those guys, you see it all the time at some of these tackles because I don't think it's a great guard class in my opinion. So teams are going to try to start on Friday, and he's going to get drafted on Friday. Some teams will look at him at tackle. Some teams will say, well, He doesn't have left tackle athletic skills or feet. Let's try to move him over to the right side. Some teams may say, because we love the way this kid plays, he's a tough hombre now, and he's going to fight you to death, that they will project him inside to guard. Um, You know, I'm trying to recall. Oh, Ezra Cleveland was a left tackle at Boise when he came out, and, and our offensive line coach and our coordinator at the time loved them, but they wanted to put him in guard because we wanted the athleticism across the board and he fit from an athletic ability. And that took him some time uh, to adjust because he's played left tackle his whole career. But some teams will look at these big physical guys that may have some limitations at tackle and move them into guard where they can use their, their, their size, their mass. And especially if they play with the demeanor that he plays with. All right, let's say you need to tackle. You're in the end of second, early third. Are you taking Matthew Bergeron out of Syracuse, or are you taking Tyler Steen out of Alabama? Ooh, very good. Uh, that That's a, a, a good good question. I think Steen would, if I want a tackle, yeah, I may uh, lean towards Steen. It depends on how my board looks, on how we had him stacked. If Bergeron is a lot up on our board and the horizontal board that we had spoken about. I don't want to go below and take a lesser player. Right. Some teams I heard really like Steen because of his athleticism. They think he could play inside at guard. Some think he can play all four, you know, guard or tackle. I don't think he's a center. Um, but he is kind of an underrated prospect. He really imp- improved. He was at Vandy the year before. And the, the technical part of the game, you can see the athleticism, but the technical part of the game wasn't there. He improved when he went to the uh, to play at Alabama, and you can see him. I wish he played with a little more grit at times, mm-hmm. but he is a very good athlete, very good in pass pro. He can be an effective run blocker, and he may have higher upside, but he may not be as gritty when you watch the tape. Maybe you disagree with me. That's why we have these draft meetings. Uh, as Bergeron. I like them both. They're, they're close. And that's why I asked. I think I was surprised at how big Steen was in person. I have to double check, but he was six, six, just close to it, I believe in three thirty. That sounded, sounds about right. Um, I, I don't believe your estimates. So what, go I ahead. Be wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, You're well, the worst can, estimator I've ever really been around. <laughs> well, I had, that's why I have to write everything down. Cause I can't remember. And, uh, but anyway, we'll figure out. I like them both. And I, I think both could play outside or in, I would have to, I would probably, knowing how I pick these guys, I would probably just flip a coin. Whatever happened, that's who I would go well, with. That's, that's, that's why you're on a podcast. You have to stand on a table. If you're going to say, Ryan, make a decision, okay? All right, I'm taking what? Matthew Bergeron. Because of why? Because I think he is. I, I think he is grittier, and I think he can play tackle, and I'm going to start him there and see what happens. Okay. Uh, I know Pete. Pete think, seems to think he goes inside, but Pete thinks that everyone should play guard because that's where he played yeah. in high school. All right, what's next, Debo? Cloudy Future asks, wondering if you have a sleeper guy that you can sneak into the first round that most do not, and if so, who is it? Well, I don't think Emmanuel Forbes is any longer a sleeper. We've been talking, you've been talking to him since the fall, and I think he's a lot to go into the first round. I've heard people, uh, I've talked to folks in the league that, that think that's the case as well. Juju Brents, I've heard, has a chance. I don't know. That's a sleeper. You don't like it so much. Did we bet that? Did we bet a dollar bet on Juju Brents going in the first round? Yep. I took I took yes. I also took Jack Campbell, the linebacker to Iowa, going in the first round. 
I don't know if that's a sleeper because we've been talking about him. Is there any sleeper in the last two or three days that, that we've seen come up? Yeah. It, uh, and uh, I'm going to say that someone that no one's been talking about that may slide at the bottom of the first round, Ooh, uh, the guy that? that I really liked in the fall uh, was the Kansas State pass rusher. That no oh, one really Felix Anudike Uzama. Yes. And I'm you say it. I didn't I'm say love he him. He has in the a fall. chance. Yeah. I, I didn't love him in the fall, but as you pointed out, they were playing him out of position, right? Yep. But when they put him in that wide nine technique or get him on the outside shoulder of the tackle, he's a Gorn Jesse now coming up the field. <laughs> All right. Another question. So we're sitting there at 31, and let's say the tr the the Chiefs trade out of the pick and someone who needs an edge rusher comes in. You want to take Felix Anudike uh, Uzama out of Kansas State, or do you want to take Will McDonald, the fourth no, Will out of McDonald. Iowa State? I'm a huge really? Will McDonald fan. Yeah. Okay. I think he now, has a chance to be Hassan Reddick. He's not as as uh doesn't have the, the grit in his pants, the sand in his pants like Felix Anudike Uzama. He's a little lighter no. in the pants, I guess I should say. Just more athletic and longer. I would okay. go with the more athletic, longer guy that does play hard. He does have grit. He just, yeah. uh, I just think he has tremendous upside. All right. So there are two names actually, because Will McDonald, the fifth, we haven't seen a lot of mock drafts that have him going in the first round, but 35 inch arms will certainly get your attention. Um, and then Felix Anudike Uzama out of Kansas State. That's a good one, Rick. Senior Football asks, Hey, Rick, can you describe the emotions you felt when you found out you were going to be podcasting with Ryan Wilson? Be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I was wait, hold on a second. I didn't yeah, bring get, my yeah, didn't I didn't bring, bring my good. yeah, I didn't bring memory. my thing. Okay. I respect everything that Ryan does to prepare, prepare for this draft. It's been an unbelievable experience. What I enjoyed the most is yeah. that sharing these experiences with you on the road when we went to the senior bowl <laughs> and you don't bring a pair of binoculars. Or a stopwatch. <laughs> or a stopwatch. Um <laughs> The combine, our, our pro day travels with the, the uh, three day thing where you was pretty much at, at the end of your energy by the time mm -hmm. we got uh, done at Kentucky. And I didn't realize that as nice of guy as Ryan Wilson is, he has a temper. And <laughs> I did not test. lose my cool on anything. You did. But Everybody's working hard. Everybody's trying their best. Yet you explode on somebody as a leader, as a servient leader, and you're the leader of this podcast. I'm just a supporting <laughs> cast. Oh, please. Have patience with everybody. It's not like someone's trying to uh, take advantage of Ryan Wilson. Everybody's working high. Debo, Debo is the hardest working man in showbiz right now. <laughs> psych. I'm well, he said psych, Debo. He said psych. <laughs> Uh, to be clear, I didn't get mad at Rick, and this was just the other day we were doing. We yesterday, don't get mad we were, at me because, yeah, I did. I one I thing, did. I, 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 yeah, I do not like people getting mad at me. No, I didn't get mad at you, no, Debo. In fact, mad. Rick is so anti confrontation that um, we weren't able to do a live hit from the Kentucky Pro Day just because we didn't have the setup. And I had to call Randy, who's in charge of booking all the stuff, to let him know. And Rick's like, don't call him now. Let Make sure I'm not here. I said, this is going to be a nice conversation. I should explain what's going on. Um, but, yeah, that's a good question, senior football. No, it was fun. I had a lot of fun with, with Rick. And Rick, had, you know, Rick doesn't like to be complimented, but Rick has come a long way since last year when he was uh, fresh off the – fresh on the set in, in Las Vegas where it's 10 trillion degrees. And now he's a he's an old, old media hand. <laughs> And don't worry, we'll be back again again together in the same space Friday night. Cassius Gaffney asks, wondering how you guys feel about the Vikings trading up to get th uh, get get their quarterback of the future, especially with Kirk being in the final year of a contract. Kirk's also 35. I don't know if that necessarily matters. Uh, we've talked about Hinton Hooker, perhaps. Do you think they would have to trade up? I think they're at 23. I have to double check. I, but I don't. I don't think they have enough draft capital to do that right now. They do okay. need to have all their picks. I believe they only have five picks, and I wouldn't uh, dip it into next year's draft to do that. Um, I think that may come into consideration where they're picking, but I honestly believe um, where their football team is right now, depending you know, on the philosophy that's going on there, which I, I do not have any idea about, um, but 
they uh, they have an opportunity to still uh, get into the playoffs. And who knows um, if they get some uh, if they get some of the uh, defensive issues they had last year uh, improved. All right, let me ask you just sort of a general question when you were general manager. Let's say you only had a handful of picks, five instead of seven or eight or whatever. Your quarterback was in the final year of his deal, and you you know, you know weren't sure if you're going to bring it back or not. I don't know what the plan is with Kirk, just for the hype, sake of conversation. Are you looking ahead to the quarterbacks that are going to be free agents? Are you thinking that far ahead? Are you looking at next year's draft class when you're making these decisions? about No, quarterback? It's, it's, okay. you're, you're honed in on it. You may look at it, but the other thing that you can't forget is Let's say you don't address the quarterback need this year, and uh, Kirk is in the last year of his deal, but there's always the opportunity for potential trades, so you never know. Right. Um, so you, you you can't you plan ahead, but you can only plan ahead so far. But at that position, you can't. You know, if there's a guy there you like and he's sitting there, maybe you take him. But if you don't, and Kirk goes on after next year and the final year of his deal, then you're, okay, what direction are we going with this ball club? Where's our ball club at? Do we get a group and possibly make a trade? Or do we just go ahead and, and start honing in on our future quarterback next year? One more follow-up to that. Have you ever drafted a guy in can you red? Have, can, can I interrupt you just for one second? Yeah. Okay. This, and Debo, at, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this was for the fans to ask questions. Me and you can t- chat about. Let the fans have their platform. We never. This first time we ever had open chat. But you want to? Okay, you need to start answering some of these questions. <laughs> All right. All right. Do <laughs> stop asking me more. questions. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. We have a few more. I'll ask you off the air. What's next? Andrew Collins asks, "Who's an underrated day three linebacker?" that could contribute early on. I absolutely love Drake Thomas out of NC State. He has an injury history. He's undersized, but he's one of these guys. I'm not sure if you saw him or not, Rick, but when you watch him play, this dude loves football so much, and he literally feels like he will run through a wall to make a play. Now, I think he's 6'2", 220-ish or something, um, but didn't get a combine invite. I love this kid to death. He'll probably go late seven undrafted because of the injuries, but special teams day one. And then a guy, because of injuries, gets on the field and just runs around like a crazy person making plays. Yeah. You know the guy that was intriguing to me that I love the style of play? He's undersized, may not be as athletic as you want, but the uh, is it Pierce, the linebacker from Cincinnati? Uh, Ivan Pace Jr. Or Ivan Pace Jr. is one, one of my was one of my favorite linebackers to watch because – he is a Gorn Jesse. Now, he has some limitations, <laughs> but I think that guy is going to be a great special team player, and that play, that linebacker plays with some grit and toughness. He has some uh, old school in him, the way the style of line, the way he plays. And uh, I'm sure you've had the thought to yourself or probably had conversations with, with staff about if the first-round pick could play with the grit of the seventh-round undrafted guy, you would have a future Hall of Famer, but sometimes those two things don't match up. Yeah, and some of these linebackers, I understand the game has changed and you have to be athletic, you have to be able to play in space, but a lot of these guys are not take on guys or have to learn how to use their hands to get off blocks, especially when they're going to take when they have to take on linemen at the and that was one of the uh, things we talked about with Eric Kendricks, but he learned how because he was so instinctive, he learned how to use his hands and you know, he had a he had a a, a great career in Minnesota. If an offensive guard, even though it may be twice his size, comes up, he's going to he's going to punch him in the mouth. And I've never <laughs> seen a guy with that much leverage that has that much punch to him when he takes on offensive linemen and instinct to, to get off blocks and go find a ball. Now his limitations are in coverage, and I don't think he's a great blitzer, but he is a fun football player to watch on tape. All right, got a couple more questions here. So this was from Victor Garcia. He asked, why is Rick so jacked? How many two-a-days does he do per week? What pre-workout does he take? <laughs> Sheesh, Rick. <laughs> so I know that you, you, you're you a creature of habit. You've said that. So you walk the dogs every morning. How long do you walk the dogs? Three miles. Three miles. And then you do work out. You have your old, your old school workout that you do every yep. morning, right? In the afternoons. 
Oh, you do it in the morning on the road, afternoons when you're at home? Uh, no, I walk the dogs in the morning. I always work out in the morning that's okay. because that, that uh, I just have always found that as my peaceful time and you just you can go do what you want. And then in the afternoons, especially uh, uh, when I was in the front office at five to six, I can go down there and release some stress lifting or doing things. Now I'm 60 years old, so I'm, I'm getting up a little long in the tooth, as I like to say. Uh, but I love to go down there and uh, exert some energy and, and some frustrations. The one, and I haven't done this in a while, but the one thing that I really enjoyed doing was boxing. And I took some boxing yeah. classes and uh, love hitting the bags. And then before you know it, uh, I was with a guy that was training some of these ham and eggers, the guys you see on, you know, Rocky and the <laughs> Right, in the David beginning, <laughs> they, yeah, they uh, grab him out of the gym. Hey, can you go fight the, uh, you know, spider? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he would have me spar with some of these guys, and uh, there was only one rule that you cannot hit me in the face because there's no way I can go go to work or go on TV or do a press conference with a black guy. So they you were wore headgear though, body right? Blows. Huh? Headgear though? No. Cause I can't what? see without my glasses. So they no hits above the neck. So okay. they were, I was like their body blow uh, dummy. So did you get bruised was, up though? Oh yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was just like wrestling that two or three minutes per round. I can do three rounds and then I was toast. And that's I, a long, home, by the way, that's a long time. Yeah. And, uh, I could only do three rounds and I had nothing left in me. But those those guys, those ham and eggs, would come in there, and I remember one guy who was about six five, about two sixty. Oh, <laughs> I'm sitting there, and I'm oh, doing this gosh. and this and this, and uh, every once in a while I'd get a nice shot because they had headgear on, so I was allowed to hit them in the head. But they were okay. only allowed to do uh, body blows with me. So um, you could actually, you were able to land a blow. It wasn't like when people say, if you pay, play in the NBA, will you score a point? You actually were able to hold your own a little bit. Well, I yeah. I, I, I would say I, I wouldn't go to, going to I'm going to make more doing this podcast than I am <laughs> okay. going to be in a ham and egg fighter for 25 bucks at the uh, down at the uh, garage. <laughs> Is it accurate when Pete Prisco calls you a meathead? Then I, I'll always be a meathead. I can't <laughs> help it. That's how I was raised. Me and my brother are two of the biggest meatheads you ever met. <laughs> and Victor, I'll just give you a little glimpse of this, and then we'll 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 get out of here. Um, Rick was a championship power lifter, by the way. And that's a fun story. And actually, Victor's actual question, Rick, is any chance the Chiefs take our guy, Jameer Gibbs? Oh, could you imagine Jameer Gibbs in that offense? It's what and Clyde Edwards was supposed to be. Yeah. So to have a combination of Gibbs and Pacheco, uh, that would be uh, pretty fun to watch. Would you rather have Jameer Gibbs or let's say Zay Flowers is there for the Chiefs? Well, they they uh, drafted Sky Moore last year to be their slot, and I think he improved through the season. Yeah. Uh, Zay, so if they went receiver, I think they need to get some vertical speed. Not that Zay Flowers can't give them vertical speed, but a bigger body. I know they got uh, Valdez Scantling there as well still, but they lost Juju Smith-Schuster. So I could see them, like if Quentin Williams was there, which I don't think he'll be there, could be a possibility. I don't think high it is. I may be mistaken. Um, yeah. but to, to put another playmaker on that offense, but they also need to get a pass rusher, uh, because of they released Frank Clark. Will McDonald, so, the four uh, the op opposite of, uh, Korla Korlofsky, Korlofsky, Karloftis or Karloftis. What about Karloftis and Lucas Van S? That, that would be. Oh, or what about, uh, the, uh, Georgia tech? That's Keon White. One. That's Ooh, that that yeah. maybe uh, when we talked about sleepers, maybe that's someone that sneaks into the first round as well. That's a good one. All right, that is it. Uh, by the way, before we get out of here, get real time updates about your team's draft picks and trades all three days of the draft, including scout reports, grades, player comps for all your team selections. Download the free CBS Sports app to use the best draft tracker out there. It's the best second screen companion for when you're watching the drafts unfold on TV. And Rick. Thank you. Good luck tomorrow with your draft coverage, and then we'll see you post-draft.
We'll be talking back here, and then we'll see you in person on Friday and Saturday. Thank you, Debo, for producing. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. They were great. And uh, I feel like I'm going to be saying this for the next three or four days. See you tomorrow. <laughs>